Welcome and thanks so much for joining us this evening or whatever time this finds you in. During a moment in history that demands all of our attention and conviction, it means so much to have you here. We intentionally scheduled this event a few weeks out from the US elections and also from the momentous Chilean referendum, both of which bring at least the promise of furthering freedom. Tonight, instead of reading off bio of our readers, which are available via the chat, I should say, I thought I'd draw upon their work to speculate and just downright riff on a question that's often put to us, which is, why does the Poetry Room always host paired readings instead of solo performances? I'm sure you've just been longing to know the answer to that. <clears throat> the truth is, a solo reading has never occurred to me. I've never known poetry as an alone. Just as in a library, we never experience a book alone, but as what is next, neighboring, near. Poetry is, as Cecilia Vicuña writes, a social life, a quote, co-laboring of forces. One does not all by oneself have it. As Norbese Philip writes, I couldn't go back to the ship by myself. For me personally, and perhaps for many of you too, I came to poetry from song, was raised singing in choruses. I think um, Stevens even called poetry a choir of choruses. And the thing about choral music is that you're always entering in the resonant wake of another. As Rosa Alcala reminds us, we don't sing or speak into a pristine environment, but into a pre-existence pre-existing and constantly morphing organism. What Cecilia calls a mass, a mess, a morass. In a chorus, which is really a rigorous multi-level listening, a being bodily in the midst of the mutable, the waves and weave, you learn to read words vertically, dimensionally, looking above and below for who will sound before and during you and to look ahead for the next breath. It's this that informed my ideas of a poetry reading, this being numerous. And it's what I encounter in the great collective ethos of our guests tonight. And what I find, for instance, in Norbese's riveting description of a reading of the entirety of Zong, in which the performers apparently fell asleep at different intervals of the physically exhausting, almost 24 hour long performance, and the drums reawakened them at staggered junctures, midnight, 5 a.m., at which point they resumed the song, truth taking its turn in their mouths. If you want to encounter the sound of truth, the sound of freedom, Fred Moten writes, hold someone else's hand up to your ears. Tonight, Norbese and Cecilia have generously offered to enact a semblance of that gesture. They've suggested that in addition to sharing their own work, they'll perform one of each other's poems furthering the resonant thread, like a thought they're trying to have for all of us in the collective head. Please join me in welcoming M. Norbese Philip and Cecilia Vicuña, who will read in that order. Am I being seen? Hi. <laughs> I always have to ask that question. I never trust technology. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I can't, I'm only, only seeing a few people. So this is kind of sending stuff out into the ether somehow. Uh, thank you to Christina. Thank you to Mary for inviting me to this. This was supposed to happen several months ago, but the pandemic put, uh, put the kibosh to that. Um, or was it last year we were supposed to do it and it was during, yeah, there was a winter storm and it didn't happen. So I'm really pleased to be doing this. Um, I'm wearing one glove tonight. <laughs> just to sort of animate Zoom, which I find is so dead. And anyway, I just thought I'd do something. Um, I was really struck by what uh, Christina said about collectivity and um, it's so un canny that um, 
Cecilia and I decided to sort of share work in that way. And I have one poem I'm going to read, which is linked to a poem by someone else, which I'll talk about. The first poem I'll, I'll, I'll read, and I'm just going to set my timer here so that I don't go over. Um, um, it's zong number, it's, uh, zong number 15 from, from the work Zong, and I thought it was very resonant with the time we're living in now. Um, let me see if I can adjust my... Am I being cut off? There, I think that's better. Yeah. Zong number 15. Defend the dead. Weight of circumstance. Ground. To usual and etc. Where the ratio of just in less than is necessary to murder. The subject in property, the save in underwriter, where etc. tunes justice and the ratio of murder is the usual in occurred. Aquila. Falope. Uma. Wiki. Jubadi. The just in ration, the suffer in loss, defend the dead the weight in circumstance ached in necessary, the ration in judge, in just. Age the act in the our way to justice. Masire Ndale, Omowunmi, Ramla, Ajani. The next poem I'm going to read is um, a poem called After Muta Baruka. Muta Baruka is a dub poet from Jamaica. Some of you may know of him. Um, my poem, uh, several years ago, I was thinking about the futility of poetry, the necessary futility of poetry, and jotted down these lines. And then I thought, I see, I thought, mm, I think Muta Baruka has a poem like this. And so I thought, well, I can't ever read my poem because it's like his poem, um, which goes to what Christina was saying earlier on. Um, but then I pulled it out last year, year ago. And so I'm going to read Muda Baruka's poem first, and then I'll read my own. Um, Mary, I didn't send Muda Baruka's poem, so the translators can just, I mean, it's pretty clear, but they can wait until I begin to read, to read mine. Um, it's called This Poem, and it's in the oral tradition. This poem shall speak of the wretched sea that washed ships to the shores, of mothers crying for their young, swallowed up by the sea, this poem shall say nothing new. This poem shall speak of time, time unlimited, time undefined. This poem shall call names, names like Lumumba, Kenyatta, Nkrumah, Hannibal, Akhenaten, Malcolm, Garvey, Haile Selassie. This poem is vexed about apartheid, racism, fascism, the Ku Klux Klan, riots in Brixton, Atlanta, Jim Jones. This poem is revolting against first world, second world, third world division, man-made decision. This poem is like all the rest. This poem will not be amongst great literary works, will not be recited by poetry enthusiasts, will not be quoted by politicians nor men of religion. This poems is knives, bombs, guns, blood, fire, blazing for freedom. Yes, this poem is a drum, Ashanti, Mau Mau, Igbo, Yoruba, Nyabingi warriors, Uhuru, Uhuru, Uhuru Namibia, 
Uhuru Soweto, Uhuru Africa. This poem will not change things. This poem needs to be changed. This poem is a rebirth of a people, a rising, awaking, understanding. This poem speak is speaking, have spoken. This poem shall continue even when poets have stopped writing. This poem shall survive you, me. It shall linger in history, in your mind, in time forever. This poem is time, only time will tell. This poem is still not written. This poem has no poet. This poem is just a part of the story. His story, her story, our story, the story still untold. This poem is now ringing, talking, irritating, making you want to stop it. But this poem will not stop. This poem is long, cannot be short. This poem cannot be tamed, cannot be blamed. The story is still not told about this poem. This poem is old, new. This poem was copied from the Bible, your prayer book, Playboy magazine, the New York Times, Reader's Digest, the CIA files, the KGB files. This poem is no secret. This poem shall be called boring, stupid, senseless. This poem is watching you trying to make sense from this poem. This poem is messing up your brains, making you want to stop listening to this poem. But you shall not stop listening to this poem. You need to know what will be said next in this poem. This poem shall disappoint you because this poem is to be continued in your mind, in your mind, in your mind, your mind. So that's Muda Baruka. Uh, yeah. Um, so here is my poem <laughs> called After Muda Baruka. This poem will not stop hunger, feed children, end wars, heal the sick, repair broken bones, or develop a cure for cancer. It will not, this poem, stop global warming, bring back drowned children or their mothers. It did not stop the Rwandan war, the Yugoslavian war, will not stop your hatred of me or my contempt for you, will not end racism, sexism, homophobia, or transphobia. It cannot, this poem, prevent a single rape or stop you selling her or him for sex. It cannot, this poem, stop traffickers packing leaky boats with men, women, children, setting them afloat on the Mediterranean. It cannot stop one single child from drowning. It won't bring Bashad down or stop number 45 from tweeting. It neither launched a thousand ships or stopped World War I or World War II and will not stop World War III. It did not stop the trade in Africans. It did none of those things, this poem, nor has it stopped global warming. It will not heal MS, autism, cancer, Alzheimer's, or stop the next murder. This is a poem that cannot, will not, did not, must not, and should not. It has done nothing, this poem, except exist. It did not lift a finger to help, did not go out to earn a living, does not work. It cannot return to first peoples their land, will not return the lost ones to Africa, teach them their languages or their lost names. It cannot solve the Middle East crisis, stop planes falling out of the skies or towers falling. It didn't solve the debt crisis or Judas betraying Jesus. It won't solve the rental crisis in Toronto to Ford from office. It will not stop period pains or labor pains. It will not save Venezuela. It cannot turn back the clock, this poem. It won't stop the famine in Yemen or help the Kurds or the Palestinians. It can't, this poem. Didn't solve the Ebola crisis, the financial crisis, the mortgage crisis, or the neoliberal crisis. It didn't stop Brexit. It cannot stop hate or greed, did not stop the Cold War, didn't stop Hiroshima or Nagasaki. It cannot create love, feed the hungry child, didn't stop Jesus being crucified. This poem cannot provide a home for refugees, did not solve the AIDS crisis or SARS or COVID-19. It didn't end apartheid, this poem. Save the Rosenbergs, stop lynching. It didn't build the pyramids. It didn't prevent slavery or emancipate the slaves. It didn't invent rock and roll, the blues, hip hop or jazz. It cannot stop hurricanes, volcanoes or ISIS. It will not, this poem, stop climate change or save our asses. It cannot. It has done nothing, this poem, of any magnitude or importance. This poem is nothing but black words on a white page. So that was, <laughs> so I always feel I have to read both poems together because as I say, um, you know, I wasn't 
consciously thinking of Buddha Baruka when I jotted down these ideas and then I remembered, oh, but he's done a poem, something like this. So I'm not sure. I think, but I think that the poems are different. His is doing something else. Okay, um, what's the next one I'm going to read? Uh, here, um, I'm going to mention Kamau Brathwaite, the griot poet of poetry. I call him Baba Kamau, who died a few months ago. And many years ago, some of you in the audience may remember there was a debate, published debate around the possibility of a friendship between Tia, one of the black characters in White Sargasso Sea and Antoinette, the, prot the protagonist. And as children, they played, quote unquote, together on the Coulibri estate in Jamaica. Um, you might remember that there's a, there's a scene in the movie where uh, Tia throws a stone at Antoinette and splits her cheek. So that's what this poem is engaging with. The title is Upon Considering the Possibility of Friendship Between Tia and Antoinette. A cheek split in two wrongs can't make it right. Between history and a hair splitting, cheek splitting to truth. The cheek of her trying to take my dress, undressing the take and took in history, can't draw blood from a stone or a tear, spill the causes of a cheek, white, split by the hard in stone, the me and she, black, words on a white page, where a stone lands on a cheek, split by the hurl, the pelt, the fling in stone in history, heals not the heart, smashed ground in the between of past and future, grindstones exacting a finely powdered present to scatter wide to the winds. Friends, you say? Only a stone's throw away. Okay, I, I'm going to read three, um, three poems that came out of what we've all been going through, living through the pandemic. Um, I'm not sure that they're finished poems, but I, I'm going to share them. This one is called Before, After, After, Before. A work in progress. In the after that we long for, do we go back to the before that was, will we, can we? Should we now that carbon emissions drop, the air clears? What do we choose as we long to hold close, to laugh with? In the before of I can't breathe and refugee camps of caged children and the homeless of the gig economy missing the safety of nets, the gods laugh, we curse, even as we worship at the altars of all that has brought us here. Will we can, should we must. Um, quick note before I read this one, which is titled In This Together, uh, I referenced Grassy Narrows, which is a reserve here in Ontario, um, which was poisoned um, through mercury um, between 1962 and 1970. The people of Grassy Narrows, the Ojibwe, were poisoned through their water by a pulp and paper mill located in their community. They have not yet received adequate compensation. And the title of the poem takes, uh, take, the, the poem takes the title from this expression that we heard, and we still hear to some degree, we're in this together. Um, 
again, a work in progress. In this together, are we where together was never? In this together of doll house condos at millionaire prices, rocketing rents that never return to in this together? Where there are banks for food and banks of money for those who have too much and care too little? In this together where rents coral the young, the poor, the worker into small, smaller, the smallest of rooms at prices that have taken flight. Nor is this, nor is in this together present in gently gentrifying neighborhoods, corporate welfare and bank bailouts, in this together of boil water advisories, grassy narrows and forked tongue treaties. In this together of fracking the earth, in this together of drill, baby drill, in this together of the burning Amazon, in this together of the melting Arctic, in this together of the death of coral reefs, how are we in this together? In this together of the hold was where self found we. In this together of song that sang of being in this together, while the blue orb spins silent, gently gliding on its ellipsis as in this together, we together were never not in this together. This poem, again, comes out of the uh, uprising in the wake of the death of George Floyd and is dedicated to Tamika Mallory, or oh, it's for her. And <sighs> we hear a lot of sentiments about looting and the, how bad it is and so on. And I am not advocating looting in any way, shape or form. But what has always intrigued me and interested me is the fact that so much of the world we live in today has been based on looting. And it has become so normalized. So again, as a poet, you know, we work with words and language and how does something that is part of the integuments of the society in which we live become so normal that it's not seen, but yet actions that are similar maybe are then called out for, for being um, somehow antisocial. Um, this is only an excerpt. It's a, it's a really long poem. So I'm just reading three pages from it. Uh, and it is referencing that quotation by number 45, who talked about, uh, he quoted a sheriff from Miami, I believe, and we're in Canada, but, you know, we get the news where um, it, uh, when the looting starts, the shooting begins. The poem is titled, When the Looting Starts. In the begin was not the word, but loot and looting they looted, their very own selves. Disassembled spirit from body, destroyed all that was. Sacred of the earth, loosed the, it loosed the inquisitors to loot the unbelievers all. Not believing in the primacy of loot, the witches were next. Then looting, they looted Africa, Arabia, Asia, China, India, a child's alpha bet of looting it was. The sun never set on the British Empire kind of looting staining the map of the world red with the blood of looting up and down the globe up and down globing the earth they strode the better to loot conquistadors buccaneers soldiers sailors pirates mercenaries and chiefs executives and officers fat and greasy with the gluttony of looting wide with the loot of looting they looted the loot as if there was no tomorrow to loot. That there wasn't didn't stop them, not caring in their looting that tomorrow is today. Loot and shoot 
and shoot and loot. Looted the looting, they looted the oceans, all five, the seven seas, and the rivers veining the skin of the earth. The seven continents, no stopping them, looting, they looted the trees, the soil, the rocks, the animals, all. The people, none spared, as if no tomorrow, as if looting was their daily prayer, bowing their heads, they implore their father up there, they implore our father, who was nowhere to be found in heaven or hell, to forgive them their daily looting. In the between of hands, they clasp sabre, sword, gun, or Bible, and begin to loot in earnest. It had been a na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na child's play before. All ring-a-ring-a rosy, pocket full of posies, a tissue, a tissue, looting meth. Audically, with an exactitude, a mathematical theorem of looting, they loot the Americas, establish a periodical table of looting that begins in 1492 when looting, they loot Guanahani Island of its name, misname it San Salvador, holy savior of looters. They loot to the north, they loot to the south, they loot to the east, and they loot to the west, compassing a world of how much more can you loot? They loot the concavity of the Caribbees, the Antillean basin of graved grief, and the possibility of infinite. They loot the wound gulf of Mexico, the islands spiraling down through the looting they're calling history and peace, peace remembering. Looted, they loot Taino. Looting, they loot Carib. Looting, they loot Arawak. In 2008, they loot the have-nots, give to those who have always looted, devoted acolytes of the gospel according to loot. Observe the religious precepts of looting in 2020 as COVID-19 stalks the land and looting loots us off the quotidian, our very lives. Shoot and loot, loot and shoot. And looting, they loot our history, they loot our culture, they loot our ways of being. They loot and loot and loot, leave us naked. But they who looting loot still were not yet done looting, loot and shoot. Shoot and loot. I have a couple more. I'm at 22 minutes. Um, let's see. Um, oops. Tech error here. Wardrobe malfunction. Need to have someone to help me. <laughs> Just excuse me, I have to pick up the paper. The poem. I'm going to read this one, uh, Not Waving, after Stevie Smith. Can just continue in this theme of community. And I can get this in my ear somehow. Yeah. That day on the bridge, there is snow on the ground, bright. It, I'm sorry, start again. That day on the bridge, there is snow on the ground. A bright day it was, filled with sharp, edged with sun and light. I saw, see him, was there for him, the fall of man who eats from the tree of good and evil, sees his own shame, broad bands of red furl from his head. The house at the end of the bridge, it spans the chasm in my mind that day. What took place? It was a bright day on the bridge. What is the sound of a head as it hits the ground? What if I had stayed at home? not gone for a walk. If I had my cell, I would call to say, I see him, I saw on the bridge, I see you lean too far out. He 
did not so much jump as fall to that which waits and waits for us all, each in our own way he falls. I see he fell, I saw the red fruit falls to the sound, the same thud on the ground, flash of his pants, he stands where I first see, saw him on the rails, three of us on a bridge, and what is that man up to, to no one in particular? But me, I think I saw a flash, heard the thud and ran back to where he was, to where he stood on the bridge, where he waits, where is he? I move down the bridge, no one to bear him up, no flash and beat of wings white in the air. Was he not the son of God too? No hands hold the weight of a light, bright day, a man at the end of his hope. He did not jump so much as fall, his body on the hard packed snow, red on white streams from his head. He waits till I pass. They throw things from that bridge to the ground below. Their guts spread out, strewn on the ground. I see you, saw you, will see you in the eye of my mind while time lasts up there and down here where I run up the bridge mouth, stretched wide, words leap into sound, pull me back down the bridge, only three words beat the air. Oh, 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 oh my, oh my. God, oh my God, oh my God, he was not waving, he was drowning. He always swam out too far. And I'll skip these and I'll go to the last two poems. Yeah. Um, this one, um, in 2015, I collaborated with Omar Barada at the annual Tamas workshop in Paris, France, and we were looking at issues of racism in Morocco. And he, um, as part of that exploration, Omar brought this um, to my attention, the Treaty of Peace and Friendship with Morocco, which was signed in 1787 between the US and Morocco. And the poem is based on this treaty um, and apparently the treaty is the longest unbroken treaty relationship in, in your history, in US history. The poem is uh, simply called If Shall. If either, if either of the parties, if any goods, if the commander of a ship of war, if either of the parties, if either, if any gun, if any more, if any vessel, if any vessel of the United States, if any American vessel, if any vessel of either of the parties, if we, if any ship of war, if a ship of war, if there shall, merchants shall, all goods shall, no examination shall, unless it shall, goods on board shall, no other person whatever shall, no vessel shall, who shall, if any American citizen shall, no will shall, the council shall, if there shall, the effects shall, the party shall, the property shall, if a will shall, the consuls of the United States of America shall, they shall, they shall, if any citizens of the United States shall, the consul shall, unless he shall, any redress shall, if any difference shall, peace and harmony shall. A friendly application shall, that application shall, no appeal shall, no appeal shall. And if a war shall, nine months shall, otherwise shall, the citizens of the United States shall, the treaty shall, it shall. And finally, uh, I'm so honored to be reading with Cecilia Vicuña tonight. I, um, Vicuna, um, I'm grateful for that honor. And the poem uh, she sent me is called, uh, uh, and Cecilia, please uh, forgive my accent. <laughs> um, La Madre Teje. La Madre Teje un tela. La Niña a sus pies, ve las hebras en la inmensidad, 
El polvo danzando en un rayo. La hebra disuelta en luz. And my very basic translation, I believe the mother weaves at a loom, the child at her feet, sees the threads in the immensity, dust dances in a ray, I'm thinking a ray of sunlight, um, the threads dissolve or the thread dissolved in light. Thank you all very much. I am speaking. From New York. As you say in Urbesi, a town built from looting that is now boarded up, preparing for the little looting because there's a difference between the large planetary looting that goes unnamed and noticed until you come in Urbesi and the little looting by the darn ass people. And it's not like you say that we are for looting but for seeing, as you see, the real looting. I begin with a translation by Rosa Alcala of the first lines of this book. It says, the self edge of the book receives the hand. A limit is a limit, a door to go through. The border asks, can we go beyond ourselves? H the self of a culture now destroying the earth. Let the hand respond. Sweat. No. The book. The book's breath right 
letting me start. No, this is not ours. And what we don't know from true wisdom. In the fullness of breath is a universal rhythm. A breath that joins the visible to the invisible. That is the Malima. Dream while he she drinks the blood and gods of demons down into a lake. See? El polvo rojo de la actividad ilumina. El vacío exige un retorno a la interdependencia radical de todas las cosas. Poetry is a supreme affinity with the world's speech. Speech, meaning a secret breath, inhalation and exhalation, the world's heart beating in a common language of perception. Norvesi. Is it Norvesi or Norvese? Sounds to me like it should be Norvesi. Because Nur has this sound like it comes from an ancient deep African being. Norvesi. Sí, claro, ¿por qué no? Sí, Norvesi. And this is the poem she sent. It says, cross the stick. It did not cross my mind. It crossed my stick. A friend of mine said, look, you have to change all the boats that are against life. You just cross the boat. You just cross the boat. You just cross the boat. So a few of us were crossing the boat as the boat is the only boat to get where we need to be. So crossed the stitch by Norvesi. She sent me on top of everything two different versions. One impossible, one intervened by commercials. And another one that's possible without commercials. Of course, I will be the commercial one because that's us. Intervened, intervened, looted, looted souls. That who we are. I don't even have enough light to see the little tiny little letters these printed in. Ah, the drawn stitch follows the gleam of needle pushed by symbol of silver to bed. It's colors of cross and breathe a pattern on the claws, white. Every lady should see the new fabrics at Miller stores. Limited lingerie, lingerie, come, prick. <laughs> Included lingerie, which is to perfection and can be available in colors. Pink, 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 p
Oh, oh, my business, this is teaching crosses. Others will not bear together round hoop main made hell fast in the evening of the evening they sit taught the stretch fabric in the full lean dark and broad weave together 40 inches wide and 48 cents per yard thread over thread cross each stitch then study after laid the shape Taking pattern in care for a red, 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 red hoop girl grew by a pink child and gentian lotus of the long busted hoop and stripped wool bone or brown and all chases and some holes with Come, we will not irritate the most thunder skin as if and slow it made from the finest quality. Egyptian cotton to its end. It should attention. The fabric on bottom available in the same shirts, forty inches wide at fifty cents per yard. In mother in daughter create with this in cross the witness. Cross. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Cecilia. Thank you, Norvesi. And because you said to me that that poem was remembering how your mama taught you how to do the cross stitch. I have been seeing the image of a tiny Norvesi pinching, blooding herself as I did trying to learn how to put the needle not on your skin, but on the cloth itself, always bleeding a little stain on the stitch, on the cross stitch. And then I remembered that the poem that you read of mine, La Madre Tejia, it has a companion, but this companion is a companion that really comes from the Shipibo, Conibo people. This is the people, the women, people of the rainforest at the frontier of Peru and Brazil, most persecuted, most amazing people who are the women are the artists. So the women artists, they see this vision of the mother as a boa constrictor. So the boa constrictor is not in this poem because it is in their poem, but only one image which is that somehow, and I couldn't tell if it's me, Imagining the boa that comes from the cosmos into the earth. If it is them or me imagining them, imagining what I am reading now. I perceive those boa constrictors as canoes of light. I decided to Google the canoes of light. Fuck you, canoes of light is now a restaurant, apparently somewhere, canoes of light. No canoe escapes the restaurant. No canoe escapes the line of the commerce. Canoe, 
le voici semina la tierra la madre y la hija juegan a hilar un bilicanave zumba el cordón luz del sonar el hilo sueña el lenguaje el habla responde en luz And these unfortunate poem hasn't fallen into the hands of Rosa Alcala, the master poet translators that turns around my mess, converting it into a poem that only she can see. So this is my non-translation, translation. Emptiness inseminates the earth. Mother and daughter play at being a court. Umbilical vessel, the court hums, sounding light. The thread dreams. Language, the speech responds in light. And I was thinking, why on earth would I be wanting to read you a poem where I'm inside my mother's womb? Seeing how her chord plays with me. And then I thought of your looting life. And perhaps we have been looted out of the memory of our life in the womb. And I remember it just that. I remember that sound. They say that in the room, when you were still a fetus, you can hear only one sound. The sound of your mother's voice turning sound into light for you to find the way out the way into the light perhaps now that we are all in prison Imprisoned and slain by this reality that we perhaps that's the reason why the poem of the womb wants to come out. And then before coming to my end, there's this need. For you, I decided to call it We Are the Thread because of what you said, Lord Bessie, that this is what spoke to you, the thread. Originally, it had another name. It was called The Shadow of a Loom. I said a loom in the street, looming above a puddle of rain. We are the thread, said she, to weave is to speak. Thread in the air, cloud in the And 
somehow, if you say you are honored to read with me, imagine how honored I am to read with you. I could never have dreamt. Only Christina could have dreamt of us together. That is because Christina and I climbed the mountain together. The tallest mountain of the world of New Hampshire. A little mountain this big, but twice of a giant mountain. Because our legs are frail and the mountain is the mountain. So for you, this is my goodbye poem. And it is a poem I composed orally. Therefore, it's a not yet poem. It is an oral poem that has been transcribed. But I don't go by the transcription anyway. I read it and it continues to shift and to transform. These ways are I performed for the first time at normal. I think the name is significant. It was not a place. It was normal. The last illusion of normal, when normal was yet a place. On November 10th, 2016, that's the day after the doom we're in began. The day after the election of 2016, when we were told, no, Hillary didn't win, another gentleman, another gentleman, another guy whose name I don't pronounce. One so called one, and one, one in such a form that now he won't leave the winning, he can't leave the winning, the looting, the loot to be left alone. So I read, I read, what did I say? Where was I reading? I was making it up as I was there, suffering, crying with most of the people who were there at the strange oscillations and vibrations of sympathy exhibition put together by Kendra Pites at the university at normal Illinois. And there I am with a number of women artists, reading women poets, converting their poems into art. And there was Jen Baird right there, and also another few ladies. And you will see them showing up in this transformed version of whatever I said. And again, it's a coming out of this morass, of this morass in the prayer of coming out of this not conceding and boarding up to prepare for the worst. Let's prepare for a different outcome this time. She's the one that doesn't exist. Pashamam, the mother of the space time. Gather here to read the reading. I pronounce it sounding R I D to read. We are so from evil, read ourselves from terror, trick ourselves from mother, read ourselves from fear, the fear we have endured. What's it to this? What's it time? Time outside, time. I am here extending my heart, my breast. 
extending to feel sense you me you 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 me me you you me you remembering a time like this reading 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 the book I remember the book of Tom of the Maya Kishet. The book begins after the world has ended. When the world is beginning again. There has been a huge disaster caused by the self-aggrandizement of the one who thinks himself big. The self-aggrandizement of the one that says, I am great. The world has come to an end and it begins with the word nothing 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 at all the soul of it all all that's there coming alive After her great victory, the goddess retreated into a thought form of herself. Says in this ancient Buddhist text, maybe we are retreating into a thought form of ourselves into a sacred yantra where she resides and can be pulled in times of need whenever we or the gods need her protection a and powerful beyond all imagination. The God is created in the shape of a cunt. The shape of a unicant. A perfect triangle pointing down the seat of life, the middle point of all beginnings, the spirit of the people, the spirit of life, the embodiment of the red thread, the thread of life. Let's call it up. Let's call it the thread she's holding tight to a white thread. And I said that because next to me as I am playing, there is this set of white and red threads. The white and red threads Emily Dickinson tied her forearms with woven in by gender being reading Dickinson. Something in me hears the thread thread. She tied them poems and added the plus sign directly, directly.
nothing beats us to other possibilities in words to what is not in the poem complete incomplete complete in the poem to read the riddle the red and white thread the infinite fertility of poetry one word gives birth to the next one form gives birth to the next the reading of the reading the reading of the reading the reading of the breathing the breathing of the reading breathing reading the breathing never stops aspiration white sea foam white sea foam when they meet the infinite fertility of the cosmos begins fertility in the normal the normal illinois when the world seems to come to an end from hatred and fear, from hatred and fear, and in this corner, Kendra biases the cross on the white and red thread. She put Stephanie Brooks as if knowing that we could be in that room doing exactly this and this is what is there these little lines there is a chain whirling round round in a still blue circle beneath it is hate it is love it is hate it is love but our hatred is almost in this thing we shall pull from our love. Our hatred is almost in this thing. We shall pull from our love. Those are the words of Virginia Woolf, read by Sylvia Bluff, read by Stephanie Brooks. Reading the reading, the reading of the reading, the warani persecuted to the end of the forest, burning the forest, killing the forest, the warani persecuted, they still say. Hello, Luis Amor, Luis Furcado. Hatred is the bouquet of love. Read the riddle, read the act. Read the riddle of the riot about to And I forgot to say one thing I should have said, which is that the poem was called The Millionaire School. Because when we started to see a few years ago, it's a different kind, not anymore, a military coup. No, that's not needed now. All we need is a me. I see if Nurbesi and her looting and the millionaires who were in tandem from the ancient past to the future that is now about to turn, turn, turn upside 
Who dares breach this silence now? <laughs> Would everyone join me in saying hello to Norvese and Cecilia? Hello. 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 Hi, Jim. Yeah. That was tremendous. I don't think I've ever experienced such a, um, like I was saying, just a fruition of, okay. of this confluence of two humans. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, uh -huh. Wow. Our baby has left us. <laughs> She's playing hard to get. <laughs> She's still muted. <laughs> Orbeze, how recently did you write the, um, some of those those works about the pandemic? Uh, a couple of months ago. A months. Ago. A few months ago, like um, May, June, July, around there. Mm. Mm -hmm. And that translation you did of Cecilia's. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> You're going to take a job away from Rosa. <laughs> no, no, no. no. <laughs> wow. One of the ways I was introduced to poetry was through Spanish poets, because oh. coming, from, coming from the British Caribbean, those in the audience who know the system, you had to choose quite early on if you were doing languages or sciences. So I chose languages. And so it was, you know, we had to read Unamuno and Dario and, you know, all those poets. So I came to Spanish through poetry, really. Yeah. Wow. How amazing. Yeah. Amazing. I, and I wanted to be a linguist, actually, and then got sidetracked into political science. <laughs> And then law. <laughs> so anyway, here I am. Uh, well, you are in the law of language, you know, and you are more than a linguist. I mean, your poetry is beyond, is like um, the real law that's within language itself, which mm -hmm. is that we need to hear. Mm -hmm. That's hearing and pronouncing for us. And it is a huge um, gift for language itself and for all of us who are part of language. Thank you. We think language is, is as it were our meaning. Thank you, Cecilia. You're both so important to me for the way that you lift language off the page and you call from ritual and repetition and soul food and just it's amazing to see you like together in the same <laughs> evening because <laughs> you reach so profoundly in other places thank you yeah it was lovely to read with cecilia and yeah there was so much resonances and sort of working off each other's work and we were saying when we were in the green room, I was saying to her how much I love fabric and thread and mm. things like that. And my grandmother taught me how to do something called tatting. Nobody does tatting today, but it's using threads. As she would tell me things like, mm. um, if a man hits you once, he'll hit you again. <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and actually it stood me in good stead because when later on in my life, uh, something happened with my first husband, I thought, I'm, Grandmother Bowles said if this happens, and so I was out the door to the lawyers. So, 
it's interesting that weaving of teaching a craft along with teaching teaching lessons, life lessons, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, mm -hmm. it's quite powerful. That was the real... ...together to the weaving. It was not I so much for the weaving. It's Sorry. For the transmission. For the Maybe transmission. Cecilia, I lost you temporarily. Could you say that again? Yeah, that I was saying that the real reason women got together to do the weavings and it was not really so much for weaving, but for weaving the language. For mm, the, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We were doing with each other, you know. And it has always been so that, and it continues to be so, that it is the occasion to, to talk in a different way. That it died by the and the threads have an agency, and mm -hmm. we listen and speak differently in front of them. That's why, for example, the kipu is perceived. You know that I do these kipus as a witness for the reason. Mm -hmm. It's not an object. You know. mm -hmm. It's something else. Yeah, and you experience that knowledge transmitted by the tatting was called. Tatting, T A T T I N G, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's something like crochet, but it's almost like making lace, something mm -hmm. along those lines. Yeah, ah, it's crossing threads also like that. Yeah, yeah. I've seen, I've seen that. Yeah, another ancient tradition. Yeah. So many people kept commenting on the intimacy of the experience, and I'm so struck by how how that is made possible can can any i mean both of you managed to emit something that isn't often present on on a, a platform of this kind mm -hmm. and i wonder if anyone the, among you has a sense of what what combined to make that possible Apart from the very, I felt like the, the freedom of your bodies and the way in which they, you interact with the screen with such, you know, a proximity and a, a fluency and, um, and also I think, I was trying to think of what it was, but it was, I think there was something about you, uh, the, the poems becoming unfinished by the other, by the presence of the other, like the way Cecilia was integrating Orbese into the, into the poem was a risk of the completion of the poem. It, it, was, mm -hmm. it was inherently made open and pierced by your presence because it acknowledged your presence and mm -hmm. required your presence. Mm -hmm. um, does anyone else want to help me out here? Or, well, or? I mean, can I, 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 I'll take this opportunity because I, I, I um, talked to you about this. Oh, right. Um, yeah. um, but it links to your question. Um, there's going to be a, a durational reading of Zong online starting on the 30th of November. And it's been sort of broken up into, um, so we're going to be reading the whole book, but we have pre-recorded sessions. We had one session last weekend um, on Sunday. And it's interesting that you're asking this question because uh, some of those of you who know the work Zong know it's about a pretty traumatic event. And one of the things that has remained with me is that in, it really only sort of began to began to surface in the evening after the reading and the following morning was that I had this sense of intimacy. There were 10 of us reading together and it was disturbing at the same time because, um, you know, when I think of intimacy, the way we're using the word here, it's in a really positive way. But, but then when I thought of it in terms of that reading, mm. it was positive, but it's within the context of something that's quite, quite dis distressing and upsetting. And so, and, but then I thought further, hmm, but uh, you can't get more intimate with someone than if you're naked and lying next to them, even, even if you're chained up. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I thought of jails where people are very living, very intimate lives in. So, I mean, I'm not really answering your question, but I'm just 
sort of responding and saying that I've been thinking about this idea of intimacy. What I thought had happened on the weekend was that because we were all wearing headphones, like you, there's a special setting on the on the Zoom platform that you have to turn on so that the voices don't cancel each other out. And we were all, we all had to have headphones and you can't read and look at each other. Mm -hmm. So you're just in this world of sound. And I wondered if that was why it felt intimate. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's for me, it's something I've been thinking about a lot in the last three days yeah. since the reading. So I haven't answered your question. I've just sort of brought it. And so it's really interesting in terms of the technology because yeah. somebody pointed out that the the default technology of Zoom is is to cancel other people out. Mm -hmm. It's an erasure that if Cecilia and I are talking, if my voice is louder, then it will cancel her voice out and so on. Exactly. So it's really interesting how the technology the is, of is is really reflecting the culture that that is that is so much about erasing mm -hmm. others and not about collectivity. So it may have had to do with the fact that we were open to each other. Yeah. And even though we weren't reading together, um, but we had talked before and and something was happening. Yeah. Yeah, I think also, yeah, we were, I felt much more than in a, so forgive me, and I, I don't want to usurp this discussion, but I, I'm so curious about this. Um, I, I felt like I was in the presence of your reception of one another, which mm -hmm. when I'm at an event, I host so many events where everyone's facing the podium and you're not experiencing um, the bodily, you know, um, um, letting in of all that sensation. Mm -hmm. um, and so I could witness Cecilia hearing and receiving you and, mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. equally you. Mm -hmm. um, very beautiful, Christina. I would like to say that I think uh, despite the infinity difference between the poetics, the language, the sensibility, the structure, the form between Ruvesi and I, I was reflecting on what is it that really communicates us and connects us. And it is the porousness, the permeability, mm -hmm. the lack of belief that you are you. See, Because if you believe that you are you, you can't really sense or feel the other. You can't, you see. It's like the other is like something, but it's not really unless you are uh, not there yourself in the sense of there, you see, but in a different sense. And I think that for me, the coarseness is what really makes um, a poetry uh, like in Uvesi is it's the voice that is speaking in the old voice. What voice is it? You see, is the voice of all the slaves? Is it the voice of all of us? Is it, you cannot pinpoint that voice, but we can all recognize it. We can all be in it and part of it. Mm -hmm. And that is tremendous. That is what uh, moves us in a way that moves different parts of our being because we are those other parts. And that's what I mean that when our, our souls have been looted, our souls have been reduced. You know, by this and so in a way, you and I, what we have resisted is that kind of looting. Mm -hmm. in, in believing and being that kind of porousness, mm -hmm. It's real, you know, it's not made up. Mm -hmm. It's interesting you say that because I only read three pages of the poem, but it does go on to talk about looting memories and looting very much what you're saying, looting, looting the soul and so on. Um, and um, although, although the poem says the poem is doing nothing, the poem I read, but perhaps that's perhaps that's part of the work that poetry is doing is somehow is somehow um restoring a recognition um of something that was looted yeah absolutely absolutely you know and um you see that's the power of the poem that for me i hear three or four of your lines and it's like the entire 
poem mm-hmm. that I don't know if you have written or not written, holographically manifests itself because mm-hmm. you are working from that space. Mm-hmm. That place is like, you know, the animal's sense, what kind of animal the other animal is, the children's sense. And we can sense mm-hmm. what kind of poem, mm-hmm. what kind of poet is, mm-hmm. where is the from, you know? Mm-hmm. And it's a very interesting thing that in quantum physics, now, I mean, when there are the astrophysicists, what are they coming to? They're coming to one thing that indigenous people are mm-hmm. very particular about, and I know that black people are also very particular. Where are you coming from? Mm-hmm. I sometimes see, for example, girls who are fighting their boyfriends and they would shout that, where are you coming from, you know? And that where is the where. We do have a departure song uh, queued up, but I wanted to see if anyone else wanted to, to say anything or say farewell or... If I could just say one, um, just to anyone who's interested in the readings to, to go on the website, uh, zong.world, and they'll find information about the readings there because there'll be a social media aspect if people want to respond to, to what's happening over the 10 days, they can, and it will be sort of put up. Yeah. It's wonderful. Well, I wanted to thank you all for your presence. Of, of course, I felt it was every single one of you was contributory to this. So, um, and I want to thank Cecilia Norbese. <laughs> I feel very raw right now, so I'm really not assembling sentences very well. But it's <laughs> you <laughs> you've, re- you've rearranged language for me, so I'm sort of starting at the beginning. Um, so we always ask our, our participants to choose a song and um, we are, our audio engineer has actually spliced two versions of the song they chose. So um, should we begin it and we can all slightly dance and 